Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11046, Law and the Environment. We're into week 11, and tonight we're dealing with community litigants and ADR procedures. Much of what we have um, covered so far relates to merits reviews, um, work around the court system. So in a sense, what we're doing now is, um, at, should perhaps arguably be done at the, at the start, because when we're talking about court procedures and merits reviews in particular, the um, ADR procedure, Alternative Dispute Resolution, or Appropriate Dispute Resolution, as it's called by some commentators, is a process that is um, undertaken early on in the litigation system. So tonight we're dealing with um, review of, uh, firstly, review of, of administrative decision making. And um, in that regard, we need to draw a distinction between judicial review and merits reviews. And we've mostly been talking about merits reviews. So when it comes to administrative decision making, we're talking about the second arm of government. So going right back to, to week one, we talked about parliament making the laws, the administrative side of uh, that is the executive administering the laws and, and creating laws through um, delegated legislation. And then of course, the third arm is the judiciary. So at the moment, we're just talking about review of administrative decision making within the environment of, um, uh, in, within the domain of environmental uh, transactions and activities, of course, um, and that's the middle branch of the um, trilogy. So we talk about litigation and alternative dispute resolution within that context, and as always in the state jurisdiction, we need to consider the Sustainable Planning Act. So keep that in mind. Now, judicial review. Um, there's a quote that I like in Bates, and uh, it's early on in the ch chapter, and it talks about courts seeing themselves as protectors of individual rights against overzealous use of power, or something along those lines. So judicial review is an opportunity for people to put a, a case before a court to say that an administrative decision maker is doing something wrong in the decision making process, and it's the decision-making process that should be challenged through the judicial review. And you'll know that the terminology I'm using now is quite different to what I usually say. In a merits review, the planning and environment court, say, comes in and makes the decision, the correct and preferable decision for the uh, original decision-maker. In judicial review, it's quite different. The court is being asked to consider whether the administrative decision was made according to law. So in a judicial review, the court is not there to make the decision. It's there to determine the accuracy and lawfulness of the decision that was made by the decision maker. In other words, has the decision maker complied with the law? Has the decision maker complied with legal process? So in a way, judicial review is a form of civil enforcement and it's directed at the administrative decision makers and the courts are called upon to make rulings. You would have noticed in your reading that at a federal level, um, we have the judicial review, uh, sorry, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. And um, in the state jurisdiction, we have the uh, Judicial Review Act. Now, if you look at the Commonwealth legislation, have a look at section five, and that largely reflects the common law. So all of these principles go right back in common law to original types of writs. And I won't go into the detail, but it's writs of certiorari, writs of mandamus, writs of prohibition. And declarations and injunctions are part of that as well. They remain, but these other writs are all now wrapped up in sort of modern terminology, um, which is to do with the judicial review. So when it comes to judicial review, there, I guess there are three main requirements or, or stated intentions. The first is to remove some of the technical requirements of those old prerogative writs or the way in which prerogative writs were administered previously. That's one. Number two is to set out in simple terms the grounds that might establish an error of law on the part of the administrative decision maker. And the third is to impose an obligation on most decision makers to give reasons for their decisions. So failing to give reasons is usually a, um, uh, a clear basis 
for asking the courts to judicial review, uh, to undertake a course of judicial review of that decision-making process. So you can understand what we're talking now is judicial review effectively challenging the way the decision maker went about making the decision or actually did make the decision. And so we often see comments that um, the administrative decision maker acted um, unreasonably, didn't act on relevant considerations um, in, in that instance. So here, of course, as I mentioned, the court does not substitute its decision. It's not reviewing the merits of the decision. It's simply determining the lawfulness of the process. So the most important grounds of review in environmental law relate to procedural fairness, improper process, excess of power or ultra vires, and an un unreasonable decision. And uh, in my notes, you've, you can read about the Wensbury principle in that regard. So the whole lot of ways in which you can attack a decision-making process through judicial review, but they're the main ones. Procedural fairness, not complied with. Improper process, excess of power, going beyond what they're powered to do, and making an unreasonable decision. So the rules of procedural fairness are designed to ensure that administrative decision-making is undertaken fairly and openly. And what do we mean by fairness? Well, there are two things. The first is that, and this is a gen these are general principles, when talking fairness, there's an entitlement for a person to know the case against him or her and have an opportunity to reply to that and a requirement that any decision is made without bias. They're kind of really two basic requirements. I guess you could add a third to that, and the third would be an opportunity to be heard in relation to the matter. So judicial review is to do with improper process, and there are quite a few ways that a judicial review can be instigated alleging improper process. And in the notes, you'll see that I think I've got nine or 12 examples there. So had no jurisdiction, had bias, exercised power improperly, failed to provide procedural fairness, an opportunity to be heard, took into account irrelevant matters, showed bad faith, delegated the process, failed to give reasons, I mentioned that before, or came to a conclusion that is unreasonable, which is that Wensbury principle. So let's just talk about two of those now. One is that the decision maker had no jurisdiction. This is just an example. We call that ultra vires. And it's a term that's also used in the context of company law. A company did something beyond its power to do. So ultra vires is where the decision maker acted outside the power. The decision maker is said to go beyond the power conferred to him or her in the decision making process. The unreasonable decision-making um, aspect is the Wensbury principle, and that's a ground of judicial review as well. And um, it provides that irrational decisions can be set aside, not replaced, the, the court's not there to actually make the decision, but the court has power to say, that's an unreasonable decision and we're setting it aside, and maybe remit it back and say, do it again, do it again properly. Okay, so are there any questions in relation to judicial review? Um, it's a really powerful process and uh, one that I'd recommend that you read about. And when you're reading, think about it in the context of what you might be called upon to do and uh, think about how you might actually use that process in a more practical sense. All right, so tonight's session won't be long, but I do want to... Um, share the screen and have a look at some practice directions that are very important. I, I believe these are in your notes, so I'll just share the screen now. And you should see practice direction number two of 2014. Now, of course, this is in the Planning and Environment Court. And you can see that it's accessed via court's website. 
So much of what we need to do is found in the court's website. So the practice direction you'll see in purpose no, paragraph number one is to set out the case management procedures for the just and expedition, expeditious resolution of the real disputes in the proceedings at the minimum of expense. Now that's really powerful. A few things that you need to, to observe. The first is that the wording of the practice direction in many ways reflects the principles under which litigation is conducted in the Planning and Environment Court. And that is that the court is there to keep formality to a minimum, and it's there to um, determine proceedings at a minimum of expense, and always, of course, to do so in a way that is just and expeditious. So it has to be as quick, cheap, fair, open, transparent as possible. Now, one of the ways the court seeks to achieve that, and in fact does achieve that, is through this concept of case management. And you'll see that there on the first line. Case management is where the judge, in the, in the planning and environment court context, will actually, actually sorry, actively manage the case. Traditionally, the adversarial, adversarial um, system that we have means that the litigation is conducted by the parties or the party's lawyers, and the court plays very little role in managing the process. That's not the case in the Planning and Environment Court. The court will be very active in um, managing the process through case management procedures. Okay, there are some definitions that you need to be aware of, and a dispute resolution plan is a plan directed towards narrowing, and if possible, resolving by agreement any of the issues in dispute. So you'll go back to purpose number one, and you'll see there it says that the court is there to determine the real issues in a proceeding, the things that really matter. And the dispute resolution plan is, require, is a requirement to the parties to consider identifying those real issues in dispute. Now, directions. You would have noticed in the legislation that there are very strict time limits, and you need to be right on top of this. So those time limits provide that you need to um, have your proceedings filed within a certain number of days of the, of the original decision, then the directions hearing within a certain event, etc. So it says here that the directions hearing within six weeks after the institution of proceedings, and you can have a look at the, the sections that are referred to in the um, practice direction. So the application must be brought by the party who proves the case. Um, so the applicant has the onus. Affidavits need to be filed and draft directions provided. So it's very common in a court situation for the lawyers to hand up draft directions saying, this is what we think is an appropriate uh, plan. The court actually makes the order by way of directions order, but a draft is often provided. And part of that is a statement, uh, statutory requirements are complied with, the uh, issues, real issues have been identified, etc. So I'll get you to read through that um, practice direction. It's very important in a real practical sense and something you need to be well aware of if you're involved or about to become involved in planning and environment court um, litigation. Now, there is an early reference to ADR in p &E litigation. And you'll see that starting with paragraph 11 of the practice direction. The parties must give consideration, well it should, but really let's say must, give consideration to early reference to ADR registrar. And the parties can make certain agreements in that regard. The application um, may be heard and determined by the ADR registrar usually at the first directions hearing. <clears throat> and then we have further review by a judge down the track, and you'll see the procedures for appearing at the directions hearing and subsequent procedures. So that was by the then Chief Judge, um, Judge Wolf of the District Court, which is also the Planning and Environment Court. If there's any questions, please let me know. So that's the first one. Second one, 
and this is again in the notes, his citation of authority. And um, you don't need to worry too much about this one, but it just provides that if um, you're, you're referring to a case, uh, what you should do is use the authorised version rather than the unauthorised version. And finally, early resolution of infrastructure charges and development approval conditions through the um, Planning and Environment Court rules is important as well. So there are a number of different rules that apply in different circumstances. Okay, um, what I might do is deal with last week's question and this week's question during the um, course of updating Moodle. And uh, if there are any questions, as always, please ask through UCRU. I expect that um, we'll be getting a lot of questions about the exam as we should. Um, I suspect that most of you have filed your second assignment now, and uh, thank you for doing so if you have. And if you haven't, um, you've got till 11.45 p.m. tonight. That is the 26th of May. So before I um, end tonight's session, do we have any questions either live or through the chat facility? Um, John, Kelly had a question on you, crew about referencing, referencing the different sections of the China Stone Coal Project EIS. She just wanted to know, do we reference as if there are chapters of a book, journal or internet source? Yeah, as, as if they're uh, in a chapter of a book rather than the internet source. So thank you very much and uh, my apologies. I'll, I'll provide a response on you, crew for that. Thank you for raising that, Madonna. Any other questions? We're all done? Okay. Thank you very much for attending. Next week, there won't be new material. It's a review week. Um, we'll probably talk about the exam though. So all the best and we'll see you then.